Welcome to World Energy Television. I'm Richard Loomis, CEO of World Energy, and today we have the privilege of interviewing Malcolm Wicks, Energy Minister of State for the United Kingdom. Malcolm, thank you very much for joining us. Good to be here. I understand this isn't your first time as Energy Minister. That's right. I was appointed first time by Tony Blair three years ago, uh, and then I had a spell as Science Minister. But when Gordon Brown became Prime Minister, he asked me to go back and do the energy job. Science was great, but there's a lot of action around energy, so I'm pleased to have this ministerial portfolio. Let's begin with, the, with what I believe is on the minds of most people here in the U.S. and probably in the U.K., and that's energy supply. Are there plans in place should the North Sea ever drop below one million barrels per day? No, I can't foresee that in the sense that up to, say, 2020, we're talking more like um, two million barrels a, a day. There's still a huge resource in the what we call the UKCS, the UK Continental, Continental Shelf, the, the North Sea. Um, a huge resource there, about 25 billion barrels of oil equivalent. So there are two stories about the North Sea in Britain. I mean, one is, yes, it is in decline. It's past its best. But the second story is that for several decades to come, it's still a very rich resource for both oil and gas. And it's a very important British industry. Now, here in the United States, gas prices have become a critical part of this debate. And we're talking about all the issues surrounding tax. Do gasoline prices affect the people in the UK in the same way? Yes, there's, there's concern about that. I mean, our, our, if people in the States think that gas prices, or as we'd say, petrol prices are high, they want to come over to Britain and then they'll see high prices. Yes, it's a different situation and taxation is, is a significant part of that. So the debate is not dissimilar in, in the UK. What measures are you taking this year to maintain UK energy security at affordable costs? Well, two big issues there. I mean, you, you use the phrase energy security. And I think increasingly in different parts of the world, people use the word security rather than simply supply. Um, I, I myself feel that given the you know, uncertain geopolitics around energy, that energy security is going to become one of the big themes in, in, in the 21st century. And, and we recognize that our own uh, reserves of oil and gas you know, are in decline. Um, yes, there's a lot still there, but they are in decline. The steps we're taking, um, and of course the UK government doesn't build infrastructure, we very much rely on the private market, but we facilitate that, it is to diversify our, our sources of, of, of supply, uh, the imports that we will need in the future. Now on price, um, a very, very big issue. Um, obviously a big issue for the motorist, a big issue for business, and a, a big issue for the, the ordinary consumer, the householder, who in the UK finds electricity and gas bills rising now, now very, very um, steeply. Um, no government can wave a magic wand and, and bring down costs, I, I, I do not believe. Um, that's not easy. But I, I think by emphasizing diversity in the future, um, not just relying on the fossil fuels or nuclear or renewables, by, by, by having a mix, um, I, I think we can try to help stabilize prices for the British consumer and the British business. In talking about power supply, analysts have pointed to 2015, where your current coal and nuclear power plants come to the end of their lifespan. What plans do you have to take care of this as these issues come up? Yeah, there are two trends which we're, we're fully aware of and which we've been, as it were, planning for. I mean, one is the decline of oil and gas from the North Sea, probably going down by about 8% a year at the moment. The second is the fact that the, the nuclear reactors that we have, which produce about, what, one-fifth of our electricity, are old um, in the main, they need to be decommissioned. Uh, new nuclear uh, won't really come into being until, well, optimistically 2017, 2018, the first reactor. Some might more safely say 2020. So going forward from 2020, nuclear becomes a very significant player. But look, diversity is, is what we're about. I meet all sorts of people who say the future is wind turbines or the future is nuclear. You know, it's um, a, a more general answer you have to give. The, the, the future is a, a great mix of things that we've set out in a very clear energy policy. It's about energy efficiency. 
It is about clean coal technology. It's about carbon capture and storage. It's about renewables. It's about nuclear and many other things. A diversity is a big issue of supply. Uh, but here in the United States, I know 97% of our transportation runs on hydrocarbons. Yes. And in order to keep those prices down, we need to increase supply. Where do technologically advanced companies like BP, Shell, ExxonMobil fit into your plans? I, I think, obviously, one of the, if you like, advantages of, of the very high prices for oil, and there are many disadvantages, by the way, I'm not happy about how how high um, oil prices are, but obviously one of the advantages is that the exploration in difficult terrain um, becomes more feasible. It, it, it's easy to argue to your board of directors or outside investors that this can be money well spent. And, and this is what you're seeing. I, I was in Canada, uh, Alberta, only a few weeks ago looking at the, the oil sands, a kind of awesome project with environmental downsides, which I think the province of Alberta are, are trying to tackle and, and remedy. They're interested in carbon capture and storage, um, for example. But clearly, um, a few decades ago, you wouldn't have tackled something like the oil sands. You wouldn't have thought it necessary. It's quite e expensive to extract. But, but these things become more, more feasible. And I think the, the big companies around the world, you mentioned BP and Shell, um, are, are now onto that kind of agenda, of course they are. Are there incentives for companies, uh, major oil providers like BP or Shell, to also invest in renewables? I think it's very an in interesting development that these, these big companies that obviously you associate with, with petroleum, um, oil and, and gas, are now some of the companies really very interested in re renewable sources of energy, as are some smaller companies. We have what's called the renewables obligation. What is that? It, it requires the electricity supply companies, the people who sell me and other householders and businesses electricity, to source a certain percentage, a growing percentage, of their electricity from renewable sources. And that's worth to the renewable industry about one billion pounds a year by, by 2010. So that's quite a key incentive for people to get into renewables. Why are we, as it were, subsidizing or incentivizing that? Well, because these are newer technologies. You know, building wind farms offshore, which is a big development in the UK, is expensive. And certainly, to get companies to invest in the newer technologies uh, around wave and tidal is, is also quite expensive, and, and that's what we're incentivizing. I understand you're going to be visiting a carbon capture storage project here in the United States. That's right. We're going to Jackson um, in, in, in Mississippi, where I, I understand that they are, are using CO2, um, carbon dioxide. Uh, I'm told from a volcano. Uh, that's interesting. Um, I hope that volcano is behaving itself when the British minister visits. I'm, I'm told it will. And uh, they're using the CO2 um, to, to, to pump into a um, depleted um, oil reservoir um, as, as an example of enhanced oil recovery. So that's you know a, a good bit of practice here here in the states that uh, I want to see and understand.